Okay, let's get started. So if you couldn't pick up your quiz or your test on Monday, I have them here. Um, so on the syllabus, it says that you can submit a regrade, if you want, of any item within 72 hours, so three days. Uh, for midterm one, I'm going to let you submit through Friday. So if you want to uh, sum, uh, submit any regrade for any reason, uh, feel free to... Uh, drop it off either today, my office hours, or on Friday. Okay, so I posted assignment four. So uh, this one is a little bit harder than the other three assignments, but I think it'll be interesting and fun. So the first problem is, how many of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem? Okay, so it, oh, some, some people have. So basically, it's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem, which I hope we all know. Um, so an equation like this, but so instead of squares, um, could we ask about cubes or powers of four, powers of five, that sort of thing? And Fermat's last theorem says, yeah, no, that that's not true. Uh, if you have the power be at least three. Um, but one generalization that you that, so one of the things in research that we like doing is, okay, we have this problem and maybe we solve it. What about a generalization of it? So uh, instead of two things on the left side here, what about three or four or five, that sort of thing? Could we have the same type of answer for in those settings as we did for uh, the proof of Fermat's last theorem? Well, actually, you'll actually show that it's not true. So, and the great thing is that not only is this uh, mathematically an important question, but also it's relatively easy to do just by uh, using some loops and whatnot. So what, you, what I'm asking you to do is uh, disprove this conjecture, uh, uh, disprove this uh, statement. And, um, and I tested it on, on my own machine and it's actually really simple to do. So I hope you'll be able to do it. Um, and then the great thing about this is that now I'm forcing you to think, well, um, is this really a hard problem? Will this take me a really long time to just churn my computer time at it? Or can I actually make my computer run this program faster by thinking about, well, um, could I use smaller data types than uh, a naive implementation might do? Or could I skip some cases in the case like, uh, if I set, uh, say, A1 to be 5 and A2 to be 6, maybe, do I need to check the case of where the values are reversed? Where uh, the first one is 6 and the second one is 5? That sort of thing. Trying to understand how can I make this program faster by thinking about uh, what cases do I really need to check? And then, um, and, and that, all that stuff. So, and then I have a bonus question here about like trying to find all counterexamples, if there are any. The second question is basically just loops and switch put together. So uh, I have a really smart friend, and uh, he likes being asked questions, namely these ones. And basically, you'll just be asking him a whole bunch of questions and then keeping track of how many there are, and then uh, that sort of thing. So being able to handle switch, Although you don't have to use switch for this, as I said, if and else, and switch can be interchanged in this uh, case, but uh, most likely most of you will be using that. Okay, any questions about uh, assignment four? When should you start it? Yeah, now. So uh, I don't know, I didn't do a naive impl implementation of problem one, but I will assume that if you just did it straightforward and didn't really think hard about it, it might take you uh, maybe a day of computation, okay? So, uh, but if you think about it and uh, try to optimize it as much as possible, the one that I wrote, although it's not completely optimized, I got it around 30 minutes of computation. So you can actually speed this up quite a bit. So I, I just want you to think about that. But any questions on the assignment? Okay, so for uh, announcements related things, uh, I reflected back on midterm one, and then I thought, well, uh, since we're getting into more complicated stuff, I think this might be a, a, a good thing to have on tests. So 
You can have one sheet of handwritten notes of any kind. I don't care whether it's front and back or what material's on it. As long as it's handwritten, uh, that's fine on all tests. So uh, why do I emphasize handwritten here? Am I just a hard ass or something? Or uh, is there a reason why I'm doing this? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I actually don't care about that. So I don't care if you share notes for a test because uh, the questions on the test have never been asked before in human history. So uh, it's not going to help you here. So why do I emphasize handwritten? Yeah. I actually don't care about that. As long as you don't have any medically unnecessary uh, uh, stuff, then I don't care. Like, don't bring a mag magnifying glass or something. Yeah. Yeah, all handwritten. It, you don't have to use one, but if you do, then it has to be handwritten, yeah. Exactly. So what I've seen in the past is on tests where I've allowed handwritten notes versus not, uh, versus just let you use whatever, the people who use handwritten notes do far better than the ones who don't because they, it's, you learn material much better when you handwrite it versus when you type it. So that's why, it, so it's primarily for your benefit to force you to really understand the material. And to think, since I only allow one sheet, is to, you have to think also, what things are necessary? What things might help me? Okay, any questions on this? Yeah. Well, I have a physical presence, so I am a real one. I, I'm not like a ghost or something. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so let's get back into the material. So what we started last time was this idea of loops in our code. Namely, that we want to execute some bit of code potentially many times. So that was a limitation of if and else, right? If we have if and else statements only, then essentially our program's gonna just go straight through. It might go into an if statement, for example, but it essentially is going from top to bottom. Here, this allows us to go back earlier in our code and potentially execute some things again. So this is a limitation that we can uh, get past. So the first loop that we saw, so we'll see three loops in this class. Uh, well, there are only three. Uh, which the main one is the while loop. So while some condition is true, you execute the statements in it. So it's exactly the same thing as an if statement, but here you go back and recheck the same condition again. And then if it's still true, then you go back in. If it at any point is false, then you exit the while loop and you never go back in. Okay? Uh, so we saw some examples like this one where uh, we start with a variable with having value 5, and as long as it's at least 0, then we print the current value of this variable, and then subtract 1 from it, and then recheck. So we saw if we change this to be unsigned in, this actually runs forever. So thinking about what data types you're going to use, and uh, potentially hazardous condi conditions like this, where you have... Uh, one type that could run forever and one that doesn't, you need to understand uh, what data types actually work and what you actually need. So in this case, um, since it's integer, if we try to subtract one from zero, it becomes negative one. So if we compare negative one with zero, then this condition evaluates to false. So uh, yeah, so once it's false, you can exit the loop. Uh, if the condition's always true, then you'll have, of course, an infinite loop. Although that's not actually true, but um, so let's think about this for a second. So let's say that instead of this, we put while true. So the the condition literally is true. Could this loop still run forever? Not not necessarily this loop, but any loop that has while true in it with stuff inside, could it still run forever? What might it stop? What might cause it to stop? But if we have, uh, let's see. So let's say we have a while true loop like this. So the, the uh, condition literally is fixed to be true. It'll never be false. Could I still exit this loop? Break. 
Oh, that's actually a great example. So the break statement, as I mentioned last time, was used for the switch statement because we don't want to have to go into one case, execute its code, and then go into another case, execute its code. The break statement allows us to get out of the switch statement. But break is perfectly well used for loops as well. So if I uh, have an integer x, which is 5, let's just say we seek out x, then if we run this program, then this loop will run exactly one time. Because uh, we print x and then break immediately exits the loop. So this is actually one of the one possible optimization you can make on assignment four. Because if you have some condition where, okay, I have evaluated it up to this point, if I try to iterate this loop anymore, it's still gonna uh, not give me a result that I want. So I might as well just break right now, okay? So a break can help you get out of not, no, not only infinite loops like this, but allow you to get out of loops early when you know that you don't need to run the loop anymore. Okay, so uh, think about that. But what's another way I might exit a loop? Yeah. So what, what does a few mean? Like, like I would say, like, six, or like 15, six and a half. Okay, so let's just say n is six. Then uh, what is one possible way that I could uh, print this six times? Well, I could just say, while well, n at least zero, and then uh, n minus, uh, equals n minus one, so it's very analogous to the example we've already seen. But what if I am a stickler for uh, while true loops? What could I do here? Well, there are actually two things I can do. I can literally just print CLX six times. Uh, th that could work, but it it's not very useful. But what I could do is uh, inside loop. So. I do need some condition on n here because I, I need to know from n if I'm not going to just literally print the, six, the statement six times. I need a way of doing that. So if I just do, uh, do this, then this is effectively the same thing as before, but then the while true loop on the outside is going to only execute once. So it, it's effectively doing the exact same thing. So um, yeah. Uh, I don't see a way of doing it with a while true in there without actually printing the thing six times. Yeah? Could you put an integer there and then put the break inside the table? Yes. So I can do, uh, I'll have a variable called count. And what I could do here is, uh, yes, I could do that. Yeah. So. Uh, here I can say, let's see out our x, and then instead of a break statement, uh, just a break statement, what we're going to do is we're going to increment our count plus one. So increment, uh, we'll see in a way to increment, but essentially just add one to it. And then what we'll check here is if this counter ever equals our, the target number of times n, then we'll break. So then I'll put the break here. Then if I run this, it'll print uh, six fives. So yeah, you can do an, uh, a counter variable here. We'll see counters in a second. But any other questions about this? Okay, so let's, oops. So let's get back into this. So we saw that. Um, some loop errors, please use curly brackets. Some of you on your assignments are not using curly brackets. Use curly brackets. It'll make your life easier. Uh, and use Yoda conditionals. So what's a Yoda conditional? So is my term. It's where uh, you have something like this, where instead of checking for equality, you're actually doing an assignment by mistake, where you use one equals instead of two. So what's a Yoda conditional? Yeah, so I, I, write, I rewrite it the other way. So to say, 
uh, if while three equals equals num entries instead of num entries equals equals three. So if you make a mistake, you can't assign to a number like that. You have to assign to a variable. So you'll be able to catch errors much uh, more quickly that way. Yeah, so just some loop style things, not really uh, necessary, but useful. Um, so while loops, of course, can be used for input validation, just like this example that we saw. Well, so while uh, the input and number is not in the range that we want it to be, then uh, have the user re-input the number until they uh, comply and actually put uh, the integer that you want. So uh, any questions on that, though? So we covered that last time. OK, so uh, I mentioned I would talk about increment. So one of the operations that we're going to see over and over and over again, especially with the third type of loop that we'll see probably next week, uh, is called increment which means that we're adding one to a number. So uh, instead of saying like n equals n plus one, which you could do, it's much easier to say n plus plus. So that's actually uh, where the name C plus plus comes from. The, the C language uh, had already existed. C plus plus adds more on top of what C was before. Uh, yeah, so it adds one to the variable. So if I wanted something like this, uh, I assign val to be whatever it was before, plus one, uh, I can just do exactly the same thing with val plus plus. So it's just a shorthand. And another one that you, you might be able to, you might see sometimes is for decrement, which is you subtract one, exactly the same idea. So, um, but it says down here that you can use something called a prefix mode and a postfix mode. So what in the world are those? So prefix mode is where you put the plus plus on the left side of the variable, um, and postfix is where you put it on the right side. So, so this is actually one of my hates about C++, is where you can do uh, silly expressions like this. Sometimes they're useful, but most of the time they're not, and people abuse them in uh, potentially hazardous ways. So what does this actually do? So is the plus plus y right here prefix or postfix? Prefix, right? It's, it, it, come, it comes before the variable name. So that means that we're going to do the increment first, then assign the value of the new value of y now to x. So here, if y was 1 before, y is immediately updated to 2, and then 2 is assigned to x. OK? Um, and similarly for uh, subtraction. Uh, if y currently at this point right here, it is at 2. And then if we do a, uh, a decrement here, then it's immediately updated to 1, and then we assign 1 over. OK? So, and then postfix mode is where you assign the value first and then update the variable afterward. So, if y was 1 just like before, uh, for a postfix expression like this, we assign the value 1 first and then do the update. Okay? So, y will now be 2 and then x will be 1, because it was updated with 1 before the increment was done. Similarly for uh, subtraction. So, um, but if, uh, consider this situation. Suppose that I'm not doing assignment like this. I'm just doing y++ plus plus with a semicolon, and I'm not doing an assignment at all. Does it matter whether I do prefix or postfix? In, t in terms of the variable. Uh, in terms of the value that'll be uh, afterward? No, because the value is not going to be assigned to anywhere. So that's why I recommend always doing uh, any update like this on a single statement, not actually assigning to any variable. So this I absolutely hate when people do it. So uh, it sometimes has a use, but most of the time it doesn't. So uh, let me ask you this. So why is there a prefix and postfix expression then? Why don't we just have one instead of the other? 
So this actually goes back to the really olden days where uh, memory was actually not very uh, cheap to come by. So, uh, and actually processors were not that powerful either. Uh, the, po the prefix uh, mode was actually a little bit faster computationally than the postfix was. Uh, it has to do with uh, things that are too complicated to explain. But uh, the reason why we have both is that one was originally faster than the other. But now, since we have very fast computers with fast CPUs, fast memory, the difference between these is almost nothing. Uh, and, that, and in fact, the compilers are so good, you might as well just use one for another. Yeah. So I actually recommend that since uh, you should put the increment or decrement on a single statement and not assign anywhere. So and it, for that reason, it doesn't actually matter. So in fact, if you don't assign to anything, it doesn't matter which one you use. And in fact, I, I don't have any preference over one over the other. But uh, if you are going to assign to a variable, make absolutely sure you know what you're doing. Because as these two examples show, you can have different results depending on what happens. And this is actually one of the reasons why so many bugs in C++ occur. Where you uh, do something like this, where you assign to a variable, and you actually meant the prefix expression, not the postfix one. So uh, all I recommend is uh, don't assign to anything. Just do the increment or decrement on a single statement. That's all I'm saying. So, uh, because then you'll actually have weird expressions like this that are just horrible to read. Yeah. Uh, good question. So, no, because uh, the postfix and prefix expressions take precedence over all arithmetic operators. So, uh, if we have something like this, then the plus plus and the minus minus will occur first. Well, uh, the, the value that's returned will occur first, then the addition will occur. So, in this case, putting Parentheses around here will actually not do anything. But you may, uh, I think what you're asking is if we did something like this. So if we did x plus plus and then we put parentheses around this, then that actually won't make it, uh, it'll do exactly the same thing as it did before. So uh, it's a different kind of operator. So uh, that's why I recommend that you do it on a single line. So for, like, do something like this. So you do x plus plus, and then assign x like this. So you do the increment and avoid the issue, this horrible issue altogether. Okay, that, that's what I always recommend. Uh, there's pretty much only one purpose we'll ever use this for, but we use it a lot. And it's with the third type of loop we, which we haven't seen yet. So it's just a precursor to what we're going to do. So yeah. Don't write expressions like this. It's horrible to read. And could, could you even understand what this is actually doing? No. So like, uh, you, now you have to think, well, is the value of num1 given first, or is the increment done first? Or is the decrement done first? Or is the addition done first? So you have to understand a lot more than what is necessary to understand what this is doing. So don't do that. Um, Plus plus has to be on a variable, so you can't do it, a, do it on an expression like this, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, don't do this, uh, because it's, it's just horrible to read. Uh, yeah, any questions on increment decrement? Okay, so one thing that we're gonna be using all uh, many, many times uh, for loops especially is something called a counter. So sometimes do you want to know what iteration on the loop are we? So are we on the first iteration or the 15th iteration or the one millionth iteration? Sometimes we wanna know the actual number iteration that we are on. And so that's what a counter is for. So the use of this is, um, so what we're going to do in this example is we're gonna set a, a variable to be one and then, so this variable num is gonna represent we're on the numpth iteration of the loop. So when we first get into this loop, we're on the first iteration of the loop. 
And then we see at the bottom here that num++ is done. So the second time we go up and then go back in, we're on the second iteration of the loop. Okay? So let's do an example. So suppose that we uh, have this task. So we want to have the user input some number n. And we want to sum all the values between uh, 1 and n. And we only have while loops to work with. So let's say we see in some uh, variable n, some integer n. So what, uh, how should I be able to do this? Or what could I do? Well, what things do I need to keep track of along the way? Well, let's see. I need to know what the sum is so far, right? Because once I input another integer and I'm going to uh, go and get the next integer, I'm not going to be able to store that integer that was just inputted anywhere. So I need to have a sum variable to keep track. What is the sum so far? Okay, so I'm going to make a variable called sum. And at this point, right here, have I inputted any of the n integers? Well, we inputted n here, but have I inputted any of the n integers so far? No. So what's the sum so far? Zero. Uh, I haven't actually inputted anything. So I'm going to initialize my sum to be zero because I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Well, how many integers am I going to ask the user to input after that first initial input? I asked for n, so they inputted however many integers they want to put in, which is n. How many times should a loop iterate? n times, okay? So what concept that we just saw can we use to keep track of how many times we have gone through the loop? Right, so we need a counter that is initialized to what? How many times have we gone through the loop before we actually went through the loop? Sounds like a silly question. But how many times have we entered this loop before we, we've actually entered it at all? Zero. So in fact, we need a counter, I'm going to call it counter, also initialized to zero. So obviously we're going to need a while loop somewhere. But what should be my condition? Well, let's say that the integer is uh, n is 15, for example. And we've entered five integers so far. Should I go through the loop again? Yeah. If the user wants to input 15 and we've entered five, then don't I have 10 more to ask for? So I need to go through again. So what should my condition be? Well, if uh, let's just look at this scenario. What if counter is equal to n? They have the same value. Should I go through the loop again? No, because at this point, we have entered n integers. So I shouldn't ask for another one. Well, for, uh, until we reach this condition, what is the relation between counter and n? Less than. Because uh, counter is not going to be greater than n to start with, because it starts at 0. So while counter is less than n, then I have at least one more integer to ask for. And then we're going we're gonna to update counter and our sum variable accordingly. So while counter is less than n, while this counter that we're keeping track of is less than n, we're going to ask for another integer. So what should I do at the end of the loop involving counter? I should increment, I should add to the counter how much? One. Have we seen an operator that allows us to do that? Yeah, what is it called? Increment. So let's increment. So you can do either pre or postfix here. Doesn't actually matter because I'm not assigning anywhere. Okay. That's all and good. So let's see. So I need to see in one of the integers because I need to ask for another integer. So let's see into, well, now I got to have some variable to keep hold of what the inputted value was. So I'm going to make 
either before or inside the loop, it doesn't matter in this case. So let's uh, have an integer x and c into x. Okay, so x is the new integer that we're going to be inputting. Okay, how should sum change now? Well, what should I do? What if, let's say sum was 10 and I inputted 20. What should the sum be right now uh, once I input that integer? If it was 10 before and I inputted 20, the sum of the integer should be now 30. Good. So how could I do that in C++? Exactly. Sum equals sum plus x. What if I, uh, I did an error and I put two equals here? What would happen? Would sum be updated? No, because I'm checking equality here. And in fact, I'm throwing the result away. I'm not assigning it anywhere. So I need one equals for assignment. Right thing assigns to the left thing. But there's actually a shorthand to do this. And I, I'm not sure if there's a slide about it. But uh, there's a shorthand. Anyone know what it is? Yeah. So sometimes when you have this, it's annoying to have to write the variable twice, especially if you have a long variable name. So one shorthand to do this, I'll put it over here, is sum plus equals x. Meaning, whatever sum was before, add x to it. So, and then, of course, if we had like minus equals, then I would subtract x from sum. If I did a multiplication here, or I did a division here, it, it carries over exactly the same way. But most of the time, we're going to be dealing with plus equals. You could write it like this. It actually doesn't make a difference. Okay, so, and then what should we do at the end? Well, maybe we want to know what the actual sum is. So let's print the sum is and then sum. So let's move this down a little bit so we can see more. OK, so give me some integers to input. So first off, how many integers should I input? Two. two. OK, so give me two integers. Oh, what's sorry? 50 is one and then 100 then the sum is 150. Cool. Uh, what if I wanted to know the average of the n integers? Well, what is the, um, what is the average uh, in general? Right, so it's the sum over what? The, the number of integers. Do I know how many integers there are? Yeah, it's n. So, what should be the average? What type should the average be? Should it be an int? No, why not? I might have decimals. So what should be an appropriate type for this? Double. Uh, in fact, I can use auto, but uh, I'll use double here. So I'll use average, avg, is what? Yeah. Uh, the only reason is that uh, double has twice the amount of storage as float does. Sometimes you want float, but pr you will never be wrong with using double. It's, in, in, in fact, since most computers have vast amounts of storage anyway, there, there's almost no reason to not use double. So it's just like the convention. Sometimes you do want float for like legacy code and whatnot, but I pretty much always use double. Yeah. I, so this is actually a very interesting topic and it's uh, very recent in terms of like the standardization of C++, what auto actually does. Um, I believe it always defaults to int if it just sees there's some typo over there. But if you have some variable that's unsigned int and you assign to something that's auto, it'll pick up unsigned int. Okay, so average is what? It's the sum divided by 
uh, the number of them, which is n. Any issue with this? What type is sum? Int. What type is n? Int. So what do you think is going to happen? It's going to have the same issue, right? Even if I, so what happens uh, for an assignment like this is the right side is evaluated first, then an assignment is given. So then because of this, we're going to do an integer division first, then assign. So what is one way I can get around this? There are actually two ways I can see, yeah. Yeah, so one technique I like doing is multiply by 1.0. It doesn't change the value, but what advantage does this have? So if you have, so 1.0 is a double. So if you have a double times an integer, then the result is immediately a double. So this, uh, remember, multiply and divide are evaluated left to right. So here, we're gonna do the, um, we're going to do the multiplication first, so I'm going to have a double divided by an int, and I'll avoid the issue. What's another way I can fix this? Yeah. Well, in fact, I don't, I don't, I don't, need, sorry, I don't need to do both of them. In fact, I shouldn't do it with n, because, um, well, actually, in this case, it's fine. But the better way is to use double on sum, and then we'll avoid the issue altogether. So then maybe here we'll do a new line and then let's print the average is average. So in fact, we can do statistics on input data pretty easily. So let's do the same two integers that we had. Oops, I'll do five and 100 this time. So the sum is 105 and the average is that number. Yeah. So. Uh, great question. What if I just took off that new line on both of these? What would happen? It, it'll just stick the two lines together and let's see it in action. So if I did uh, 2, 5, 100, then it's just going to print the two lines side by side. So it's just formatting. Yeah. No, I don't actually need it. But it, it well, I never need it, but it's just like it's formatting if I wanted to print something else later. Uh, if I asked you to format it nicely, then I might. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it would depend. Yeah. So, like, uh, you mean right here? So that, that would just put a new line first and then the stuff afterward. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, uh, if we... Turn this back to an int. Remember, the right-hand side is always evaluated first, and then the assignments take place. So here I have an int divided by an int. So regardless of the type on the left side, it's going to evaluate it first on the right side. So let's actually see this. So note that when I had it fixed, we had a 0.5 here. So let's do it uh, this way. So let's put the two integers again, and I'm going to get 52 out. So the right-hand side is evaluated first, then the assignment takes place. So regards to the uh, evaluation on the right side, it doesn't matter what type's on the left. It's just um, the type uh, communicates to the compiler, hey, this is the type of the, the resulting thing, not of the right-hand expression. So sometimes you may have uh, something of one type assigned to something of a different type. In this case, like an int can be turned into a double. So that still be the same case even if the double average went to a new line and then said that equals sum Yeah, it, it would do exactly the same thing. Yeah, the, there's no difference. So if I, it always evaluates the right side first. So I can't, there are some weird cases, but uh, splitting it up into two lines versus one line like this, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, other questions? Okay, so let's get back into this. So uh, having the user control a loop can be uh, can have security consequences. So maybe 
uh, here this limit, maybe we'll use the clamp function like you're learning in the lab uh, to cap this if necessary. But uh, you can actually have a variable number of times how many times you go through the loop. Uh, maybe by the user or something else. So this is actually the example that we did, uh, essentially. So uh, an accumulator here is just, we're going to accumulate some value. So initially, we're going to start with some initial value, and then every time in the loop, we're going to update it with some new value. Um, maybe one example you might want to do is, uh, you could add all of the remainders of whatever the current number is. But here we just add the current number. So you don't have to necessarily just add num to the current sum variable. You could uh, update it however you like. Okay, maybe you want to uh, add five to it every time you go through the loop, that sort of thing. Okay, so, and then a running total is just the accumulated sum, and accumulator is the variable that holds that value. But one thing that might be useful for entering a lot of data is something called a sentinel. So how many of you know what a sentinel is? Okay, so a sentinel, what that does is, uh, do we know in advance how many times the while loop is going to run? Like, am I telling it, you're gonna run 100 times? Well, maybe I am from the user input, but not generally, right? So. Uh, a sentinel, what it does is basically a stopping criterion. So if we, for example, input some sentinel value, that'll communicate, hey, this will stop the loop. So in this example, what we have is uh, maybe I'm entering your test scores into this program and then maybe compute some statistics with it. Uh, that's not what I actually do. <laughs> I use Excel, but uh, maybe I... Uh, this could be a fun lab to do, something like this. Uh, I'll think about that. But maybe what you could do is, uh, you don't know how many input data that you're going to give. So what you're going to do is say, okay, uh, negative one is an invalid value anyway. Let's use it as a way of stopping the user from having to enter more data. So maybe we can do, what we can do is, we can just um, uh, have the user keep inputting data and until we see this sentinel value, we're just gonna keep asking for data until they do, in which case we'll stop. So in this example, we have, uh, while the uh, variable of what we just entered is not the sentinel value, so we'll keep going as long as it's not the sentinel, uh, then we'll update the relevant variables, print anything we need to, okay? So then uh, we'll just keep going until we reach negative one, and then after the loop, maybe we'll do some statistics, that sort of thing. So it's just some special value. Um, why might this be useful? So in every file on your computer, it depends on the OS, but pretty much any uh, file on your computer has what is called an end of file marker. So I can actually show you this. Well, in some sense I can show you. Remember the ASCII table. So if you look at, oh, where are you? Uh, EOF. Okay, so here uh, there are some uh, characters that represent, uh, that have some special behavior. So what could happen is, how do you know when a file ends? Because on a hard drive, you can think of it as just a long sequence of memory locations. There's there's not uh, anything special about them. So if I just read some memory location and just keep going, how do I know when to actually stop? Because in theory, what I could do is I could just keep going until the, I reach the end of the hard drive. I can read all of the data. So this is where the end of file uh, type characters are for. As long as we don't see this sentinel value, keep reading data. But if I see this end of file character, then I'm gonna stop the pro, uh, reading any more data. So have we seen a sentinel before? The answer is yes. But where have we seen a sentinel? The null terminator, where was the null terminator used? In strings. So exactly the same scenario. How do I know when to stop? 
So if I wanted to print all the characters in the string, like I print C out this string, how does it work on the back end? Well, what it does is it processes every character until it gets to the null terminator using a while loop. Or one of the other loops we'll see, but maybe a while loop in this case. Okay, so sentinels are just a way of figuring out when to stop. Yeah. Uh, right, so that's why negative one is a good choice because negative one is an invalid value. But if negative one was a valid value, then this would be a bad sentinel. Because if I entered negative one, maybe I intended to put negative one in, right? Maybe I'm horrible and I can give negative points. So um, uh, putting a value here that uh, is an invalid value is actually what is most important about a sentinel. Yeah. Yeah, so that'd be another condition that you can do. But sometimes, like for strings, you may want to check for equality with a particular value. Or while it's not equal to this particular value, it, it would be weird to say, well, what if it was less than this other string? That, so, um, so you're right. I could do uh, while points is strictly greater than negative one or at least zero, both of those are fine in this example. But sometimes you want a particular value out of this. So, or maybe while points is not equal to negative one or points is not equal to zero, for example. So finding out what the sentinel values are, are is most important. Okay, any questions about sentinels? Yeah. Oh, what's her? Uh, no. No. I have not seen the matrix. I feel like I am in the matrix right now, but. <laughs> well, did they enter negative one ever? <laughs> Well, if they do, let me know. Okay, so I have two and a half minutes. So uh, that's the while loop. But sometimes, uh, could the while loop that we've seen uh, be entered zero times? Yeah, so we actually saw an example of this. So um, I think. So here, remember, we checked last time if while val is less than or equal to zero. Uh, I changed this to less than earlier. So that loop would be entered zero times. But sometimes what you may want is the loop to be entered at least once. Okay? Sometimes you may want that. So that's where a do while loop comes in. It works exactly the same as a while loop. You have a while uh, condition at the end instead of the top. So here, uh, the do while says, you're going to enter this loop at least once guaranteed. Uh, and, but you could keep going while the condition's true. So wh what is a scenario that uh, you may want one time instead of possibly zero times? What if you were presenting a menu to a user? Well, would you ever want to present the menu to the user zero times of what they could do? No, so that wouldn't actually make sense. So a do while is great for uh, interfacing with a user. Hey, you should enter something here. And here's the menu for what things you can actually do. So a do while is great for that purpose. Uh, yeah, so it works exactly the same thing. But um, one condition that one thing that you may want to check out for, uh, I still have a minute, uh, is this semicolon after the while loop. So that one is actually needed in this case. So I, I said before, while loops should not have a semicolon after them because you may have an infinite loop in that case. But here you have to use a semicolon. So it's a little bit weird in this case. Um, yeah, so it's mainly used for menus. So uh, while uh, a choice is either, yeah, I want to enter more, or yeah, I want to enter another one, capital or lowercase y, then we'll go back in the loop. Okay, any questions about do while so far? Great, I'll see you on Friday. Don't forget to pick up your test and quiz if you haven't done so already.